Welcome to Skynet Today's last week in AI podcast, where you can hear AI researchers chat about what's going on with AI. As usual, in this episode, we will provide summaries and discussion of last week's most interesting AI news. You can also check out our Last Week in AI newsletter at lastweekin.ai for articles we did not cover in this episode. I'm Daniel Bashir. And I am your other host, Andre Karenkov. For our regular listeners, Sharon is out on her honeymoon. So Daniel is once again filling in, which is going to be fun. Exciting. Indeed. So on this episode, we'll be talking about training new drivers with autonomous driving, startups uh, buying other AI companies, research on denoising uh, images taken at night, and on enabling Alexa to speech, speak a bunch of languages, surveillance in South Africa, actors opposing uh, AI that could steal their jobs, and some fun stories about silly uh, things that were done with AI. But before we start, I want to shout out a new review we got on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it's, the title is a very clear uh, view on latest news in AI, smiley face. And it says that apparently the hosts are well-read and smart AI experts and uh, would recommend and grateful for the effort we put in to the show to broaden the horizons. So thank you so much for the review. As always, we are really happy to see that our efforts are paying off and at least some people are benefiting from it. Uh, yeah, and so we'll keep on trying, especially given the, this type of feedback. All righty, so let's uh, go ahead and dive into the news. First up, as far as applications and business, we have GM patents autonomous tech to train new drivers, Sans Instructor from carandriver.com. So as the title implies, uh, there was a new patent uh, filled with the United States Patent and Trademark Office by GM that is this idea that you could train a driver with just an autonomous car without another human in the car. And this patent describes how uh, basically the car would be able to keep track of a bunch of metrics, like how well uh, the driver is using acceleration, braking, and, and steering, and would ultimately provide a score and basically tell the driver whether uh, they did well or not, and, and hopefully also provide feedback. Uh, <laughs> you think this is a good, good idea, Daniel? That's a good question. It intuitively strikes me as something that's a lot easier than full self-driving, and in that regard, I'm like, okay, at least they're not trying to jump that far. But that being said, I, I certainly do have questions about how well this would work. I, I do feel like it's something that's worth testing and gathering data about just to see how it pans out. I can't really say that I have a good intuitive sense one way or another, whether it'll be a home run or is just going to be an absolute catastrophe. But I do feel like it's something a lot more likely to succeed in the near term in terms of helping drivers out. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. Uh, this is obviously just a patent, so it's not clear if anything really will come out of it. But there have already been similar ideas. Uh, for instance, Tesla now has a safety score that you need to do well on to be able to get into a beta of FSD. So it, it is possible to do some sort of scoring on how well you're driving. And there's actually you know, some um, insurance companies that do some sort of app-based evaluation and also give you a score. So I could definitely see this becoming part of training, uh, but I feel like this sort of metric would probably be best to be used alongside a human instructor who can actually explain how to do things well uh, instead of it just being purely the car and, and no human instructor. 
Agreed. With any scoring mechanism, anything that really attempts to rank people based off of some skill or anything similar, especially when it's done by an automated system, I always have concerns about the creep in of confounding variables, other aspects that really just shouldn't be taken into consideration that are. It's not as obvious whether in this case, biases, you know, things like racial issues and all of that would actually manage to creep in here. But I do feel like that's something that still needs to be watched out for. And I'm curious what sorts of issues could actually creep in. So I just hope that if this ever gets deployed, people are really careful about that. Yeah, I would not imagine this would be a thing for quite a while. I mean, uh, even actual drivers can't use self-driving in, in most cases. So student drivers, I would imagine, would be even more limited. Uh, but I could definitely see this being useful down the line. Uh, you know, learning with human instructors is pretty expensive. So it would be nice to be able to at least augment that. That's true. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't mind saving on the cost. So our second story here is moving a little bit to something that's actually happening today. You may have noticed that the IPO market not too long ago was pretty white hot. And that seems to have slowed down pretty recently. A Wall Street Journal article actually talks about how startups themselves has started to join the AI acquisition rush. And there are a couple of different things that are happening here. First off, you've seen a pretty significant rise in the number of AI startups in general. Second, you've seen a lot of money going into AI startups in particular. You can look to sources like the AI index for evidence and numbers and what that actually looks like. But a lot of those startups are not having the chance to IPO anymore since that market is cooled down. And so the success criteria for a number of those businesses has become acquisition. And that acquisition now is not just being done by public companies, but by other venture-backed startups themselves. In fact, the article says venture-backed startups spent about $8 billion acquiring roughly 72 AI startups last year. That's compared with 49 in 2020. There's a couple of examples here, in particular, Gupshop Inc., which is a business messaging chatbot developer, announced its plans to acquire Active.ai, which is a Singapore startup that develops conversational AI software for banks, credit unions, insurance firms. And this is actually Gupshop's third acquisition in less than six months, which is, it sounds like a lot for a company that isn't yet public. There are a lot of thoughts on what actually is going on here. I think many people agree that the AI sector is overinvested. There are too many companies out there. And for those smaller companies, it seems like a good time to get acquired, even if it's by another startup. Some of them are being acquired for the technology. Others are just being acquired for their talent. So it's a pretty interesting scene that we have going on here. I am not surprised that the AI startup scene exploded as it did, but it's interesting to watch how that has panned out in even startups wanting to acquire others. Although that does make some sense if you think about the fact that many startups will want to expand the range of capabilities they offer or really just expand their AI talent pool. What do you think about this, Andre? Yeah, this is an interesting development. Uh, In our newsletter, we often actually have some stories on new acquisitions by different companies. So this has been a pattern. And I think it is an indicator of that in the AI startup space, a lot of companies are pursuing similar opportunities. So like chatbots are really big. Uh, some things like uh, digital um, kind of deep fakes. There's a lot of things for sort of ad stuff, uh, cybersecurity. And there's a few big kind of sectors where I think there are a lot of startups competing. And at some point, you know, it makes sense that there will be consolidation. This uh, definitely happened to some extent in the autonomous driving space where we've seen 
you know, literally hundreds of startups all trying to do very similar things. And at the end of the day, a lot of um, the smaller startups got bought out because the bigger, more kind of front runners in autonomous driving wanted to not just get the technology, but also get those employees, those people with the necessary skill set which is still um, not necessarily a big market, especially in terms of having domain expertise and not general knowledge of AI. So um, yeah, interesting story. Uh, I'd be curious to see, in addition to these stats, just how many new startups are being founded, things like that uh, as well. But uh, Given the economy right now, I don't know if uh, we'll see a slowdown in AI as well. But uh, yeah, interesting developments and, and kind of does speak to AI as a startup space maturing a bit. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to watch the interplay and bouncing around between startups working on a variety of different things. On the one hand, you've got longer term versus near term bets. So autonomous driving being a case of a pretty long-term bet, at least if you're talking about solving the full problem. Then you've also got wider versus narrower problems. Speaking of a wider problem, I guess autonomous vehicles kind of comes back. But you've seen, as you pointed out, Andre, just a number of startups that are focusing on even the same small problems, like deploying language models as a service, things like that. And... It does seem like those are the types of startups that can only arise in a scenario where you've got a startup market that's really flush with money and people can just gobble up venture money for almost anything they can imagine. And there's so much talent out there. I am curious also to see how that will consolidate in the future, but it definitely does seem to me like in the immediate term over the next few years, we might see investors, startup founders looking to work on problems that are maybe a little bit heftier in scope, have a bigger promise of payout if they succeed, but then also are maybe less risky and long-term than autonomous driving. Yeah, I think probably that is likely. I think a lot of the sort of most promising things like autonomous driving and automation of warehouses are already pretty saturated. So I think there'll be a lot more kind of efforts towards more niche problems and applications uh, or, or just ones that are underexplored, uh, like, uh, you know, let's say, creative tools. We've, we've covered some of these kinds of things. Uh, so yeah, it'll be cool to see kind of the space expand, I suppose. Makes sense to me. Yeah, and uh, then moving right along, we're going to have a short episode, no lightning round this week. Uh, so in research in advancements, uh, first story is UC Berkeley and Intel's photorealistic denoising method boosts video quality on moonless nights. Uh, again, this is pretty straightforward from the title. There's a new method that... Uh, given a photograph taken uh, at night when there isn't much light. Uh, as anyone would know who's tried this, there's a lot of noise that you get, especially if you don't have a long exposure photograph. And if you're trying to uh, photograph something that's moving, you really can't afford long exposure to get more light. So you end up with noise if you're trying to do that. And noise here just means, you know, a lot of dots that are green and red and so on. And so, yes, these researchers at UC Berkeley and Intel uh, had a new paper titled Dancing Under the Stars, Video Denoising in Starlight, uh, you know, quite poetic. And they showed that the combination of techniques uh, like having a high quality camera that's already optimized for low light imaging and then also having a learned noise model using a noise generator uh, from actual noisy images from a camera, and then finally using a learned model to denoise the images taken from a given camera. 
And as you might imagine, they compared to other techniques. This is not a new application area, and their results are the best. They are quite, actually quite impressive. Um, you know, they look pretty clean, which is uh, quite impressive given these are photographs just under starlight. And um, yeah, I would say pretty impressive. What do you think, Daniel? The results look really good to me. I think this is a pretty neat method and it's cool to see GANs and denoising methods being applied to so many different areas. I think this is one particular application I hadn't quite thought of before, but now that I've seen it, I'm not really surprised that someone went for it. Yeah, and there's some interesting details here, like um, the paper describes that on a sunny day, there's an elimination level of about 100 kilo lux, I guess that's the measure. And then in moonlight, you'll have only one lux, so orders of magnitude less. And then in just starlight, no moon, you have even uh, sub milli lux. So again, orders of magnitude less than on a sunny day. So it's quite impressive you can get anything close to a clean image. Um, although this does require this high quality CMOS camera, so you, you can't quite do this for smartphones yet, but I could easily see this uh, coming to smartphones soon or something like this. And, and perhaps already there is something like this for uh, photographs taken under low light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be pretty exciting to see novel methods like this deployed in smartphones today, although I'm sure definitely perhaps some limited version of this already exists, as you said. So our next story turns to a little bit of a different problem people are working on. Amazon recently released an open source speech data set that supports 51 languages. And the hope there was to encourage developers to build more third-party apps and services for Alexa, its AI speaker device. Really, the long-term goal here is you can imagine perhaps scaling natural language technology to many languages, if not every language on earth. That's definitely a lot more than 7,000, but it does sound like Amazon wants to move in that direction. And while we've seen speech recognition and natural language processing, natural language understanding algorithms improve, that technology is limited to a few select languages. In fact, a big problem people are paying a lot of attention to today is just the fact that a number of languages do not have a significant amount of data for AI systems to train on. And as a result, it becomes much, much harder to develop a good workable AI system for people who speak that language. This is um, really kind of a continuation of some of the efforts Amazon has been doing. And the data set is called the Multilingual Amazon Slurp for slot filling, intent classification, and virtual assistant evaluation, or MASSIVE for short. It contains 1 million spoken samples across those 51 languages, as well as open source code to help developers train multilingual AI models. They're hosting a competition called Massively Multilingual NLU 2022, and in it, they're challenging researchers to build the best translation systems they can. Those results from that competition will be presented at a workshop in the EM NLP conference in December. I'm pretty interested to see this development. I think it's good that companies like Amazon are paving the way and trying to move into expanding the resources for data sets in different languages and encouraging researchers to work on multimodal systems. I am curious how far they'll be able to take this. I agree. Yeah, I think this has generally been a trend in natural language processing as a field, recognizing the importance of working on languages beyond just English. And a lot of these big companies like Facebook, in particular, that are all over the world, have been uh, working towards this. Uh, and we've seen already 
multilingual data sets, in particular from translation. But this is pretty new in that this is a spoken language uh, data set. So there's a lot of audio in here. And it's not common to have gigantic uh, spoken language data sets still. There's really not many out there yet, which is a pretty big limitation. And this one is, is quite impressive. Uh, like the way it was made, it was made by having professional translators translate an English-only data set into all these other languages spoken across Africa, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, it is limited to kind of simple things that you would say to an Alexa that, uh, you know, questions or asking to play a song or a specific artist or asking about whoever. But um, yeah, I would say this is a pretty big deal uh, given the state of data sets for speech recognition and is a good sort of example of where a lot of the field of natural language processing and natural language understanding is moving, of, of recognizing the importance of techniques that work beyond just English and models that uh, you know democratize development of AI applications, not just in English speaking countries, but uh, elsewhere as well. Agreed. All righty, moving on. We have something new. Uh, we are selling out. <laughs> yes, we're going to have an ad, but uh, our justification is this is an ad for something we generally like. In fact, we are using it right now. We are using. Uh, Zencaster, which is a website and a service you can use to record things like podcasts or generally any sort of audio. And we've been using it for over two years for all of the recording we've ever done on this podcast. Uh, we've always used Zencaster. So we've spent hundreds of hours using this tool. And yeah, I really like it. I think it does a lot of nice things, it, it records well. It backs up your audio to the cloud. I've had very few issues with that. It uh, is really easy to use. You just send out a link and whatever, go, uh, whatever uh, guest you have can just click on the link to join. It's very painless. And it produces different uh, audio tracks per recording, which is really important for editing. So if you use something like Zoom to record, you would not get that. And that's why we've never used uh, Zoom. So there you go, that's the ad. Uh, I do like Zancaster genuinely, and I would recommend checking out if you need something like it. You can go to uh, http at send.ai slash last week in AI and get 30% off their pro account of the first three months of the pro account. So yeah, I would recommend try it out. It's free, and uh, if you like it, you can then go for a pro account. All righty, ad break over. Uh, apologies to anyone who is annoyed, but uh, you know we're trying it out. We'll see how it goes. Now we are moving on to society and ethics stories. First up, South Africa's private surveillance machine is fueling a digital apartheid from MIT Technology Review. And this is a quite massive article, which goes into a lot of detail in, into the development of uh, basically a, a lot of surveillance technology in South Africa. So, uh, to put it shortly, there's been a lot of efforts in installing uh, surveillance cameras in various regions of um, South Africa, especially more kind of affluent areas. And if you look at these cameras, they're pretty serious. There's uh, like, you know, six cameras pointing in all sorts of directions and you have a bigger camera. So it's pretty noticeable. And so this has been an ongoing effort and it is actually being done by a private company. It's being done by this company, VumaCam, which is building this nationwide CCTV network and already has uh, over 6,600 cameras 
uh, more than 5,000, which are concentrated in this uh, more affluent area of uh, Joburg, uh, the city. And uh, unsurprisingly, AI is quite related here. It's, it's not too clear how much AI is being used. It appears that there's no facial recognition yet. It's not quite as advanced as China's surveillance, but they do have a system called Proof360, which is already doing some of this work of analyzing footage to trigger security alerts if there is unusual activity. So yeah, this is a very detailed article going into a lot of sort of the ethical dimensions of here, how it connects to apartheid and the history of South Africa. And it definitely kind of speaks to an overall trend of that we've seen increasingly here on this podcast of AI and surveillance becoming more common really uh, all over the world, including in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. So uh, definitely a very informative article, and I would say once again demonstrates that this topic of surveillance is possibly one of the important things to keep in mind with respect to AI today. Agreed. It's always concerning to see new stories like this, and it's often hard to predict in which way things will develop. I think that very much like the internet, a lot of the development of different sorts of AI systems is in and of itself something that's amoral. And what you have to remember always is that for every benefit that comes along with the development of the new AI capability, there is also a nefarious use, something you might be a little bit concerned about that comes along with that. And I think we've just been watching that play out over the past few years. We first saw all of the cool things people could do with facial recognition systems. Now we're starting to see a lot of the more negative consequences of that start to play out and start to be analyzed. And I think it's going to take us a pretty long time to figure out how we balance those two developments and how the legal field and other areas kind of come together in discussion of what we should be doing here, whether regulations are required and all of that. I, as always, am not a big fan of things like surveillance, especially when AI systems are involved. But I do, I do have the sense that these sorts of scenarios are going to continue to play out in the future, at least for the next few years. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, it's important to note that, you know, at present, there's no facial recognition. It doesn't seem to be used for, let's say, surveillance of individuals uh, so much as just events in the city. Uh, but it can track license plates, for instance. And it's really clear that building out this nation, nationwide network of cameras uh, and having this company that supplies AI analytics, it's really only a matter of time uh, until there's much more advanced surveillance, unless there are some legal regulations as to what is allowed. And, uh, you know, given this is a private company as well, you know, it's, it's even less trustworthy and less transparent. So, yeah, really, really interesting to hear about this development in South Africa. Before this article, I really had no idea uh, something like that was happening. Uh, so, yeah, if you want all the details, check out the article over at uh, MIT Tech Review. Mm hmm so our next story raises different sorts of concerns about applications of AI. This comes from the BBC. There is a performing arts workers union named Equity that warns that actors' livelihoods might actually be at risk from AI systems unless the law changes. And it has launched a new campaign called Stop AI Stealing the Show. Over the past couple of months and years, we've seen more and more developments in generative models, specifically things like deepfakes 
or other synthetic mechanisms to create things like voices, for example. So now AI systems can take samples of an actor's voice or face and generate content out of that. In fact, we've seen examples of more or less bringing people back from the dead by taking samples of their voices or their likeness and then creating deep fakes based off of that. And this can be a really useful creative tool, but the union involved here is concerned that actors might not be able to control the use of their likeness and that likeness might be used without their consent or without adequate remuneration if they receive any compensation for that use at all. And when actors work with AI companies, most don't know their rights and are required to sign non-disclosure agreements. In a survey of 430 of its members, this union found that 93% of audio artists felt that AI posed a threat to their employment opportunities. And one respondent, in fact, said that their voice had been used in huge marketing campaigns by global companies over the previous six months, but they didn't even receive a penny. Therefore, these actors end up risking undercompensation if anything at all for the work they produce and the work that gets produced based off of their likenesses. It's expected that this sort of thing was bound to happen. There aren't a lot of regulations around the use of some of these nascent technologies. And as we always know, policy regulation takes a lot of time to catch up to the newest technologies of the day. I think only recently in the past few months and years, we've seen generative models that are capable enough for this sort of thing to be plausible for companies to want to use the likenesses of actors and generate deepfakes based off of them. And since that is so new, it's we're not yet at a place where we have rules around what should be done here. And even before thinking about legal mechanisms, I think that we still haven't established a good intuition about when should we use this capability? When is it justified? When is it moral to do so? Because these capabilities have only been realized in the past few years. So I'm curious to see how the conversation will develop first on the front of what do we think are the principles that we should use for creating content based off of these deep fake systems? And then I'm really curious how that's going to manifest in areas like copyright law. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's interesting. We've discussed this exact thing before on the past podcast of the implications of deep fakes for artists and actors and talked about how potentially there needs to be some sort of kind of uh, copyright over your own likeness that you can then license for people. And because that's not the case yet, as these uh, actors are claiming, it is a really kind of a area where it does seem like uh, you know they have a very solid ground to say that something needs to be down, done. And it's interesting if you Google this campaign, Stop AI Stealing the Show, they have quite a few details uh, as to why they believe this and um, you know what their argument is and what should be done. There's a whole report that is dozens of pages long and has some interesting details, such as, uh, for instance, famously, I think the first text-to-speech uh, voice on TikTok that you know generated the sounds for a given audio was based on the voice of a Canadian uh, voiceover artist who was hired to do a text-to-speech job for an translation app. And then this was massive, obviously. A ton of people used it. It was really beloved and, and super common. There's probably millions of uses of it. But the actor on the, whose voice this was based got nothing and you know, was not even asked uh, by TikTok, uh, who was not the client of this uh, actor in the first place. So, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely already a big deal for voice over actors. As you say, 93% of them are concerned. And it is soon going to be a big deal for you know, any actor with 
visual deep fakes uh yeah it's it's already pretty clear that this is coming and coming soon so agree it's also i think just really important to quickly note before we finish up this piece the other side of things in regards to how coming up with copyright laws and actually implementing them is a really difficult process and there's a lot of trade-offs involved there so in this case People are concerned that changes to copyright law could negatively impact free speech or stifle innovation. And the government itself, when you know we look at Europe, has a national AI strategy of its own. And with respect to this story, they did tell the BBC they wanted to ensure that AI was regulated in a way that encouraged innovation while protecting people and their fundamental values. So there's always this kind of tension and trade-off here in that you want to allow AI to flourish and develop and continue to get better, as with many technologies, but then you also want to protect people's rights and values. And so there's always this question here of how do you make the trade-off between the two things? And it's often not very clear exactly what that ends up looking like in the end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not a, and it's not an easy problem, but in some sense, I think that's why it's encouraging that this, uh, seemingly, I guess, union of, uh, performers launched this campaign because they have pretty clearly laid out kind of directions that aren't just broad that actually could be pursued. So, uh, again, yeah. Interesting to see this continuing of, uh, these implications of deep fakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this sort of advocacy is certainly important. I can imagine from a regulation side, if these particular issues just don't get brought into the public consciousness at all, then nobody's going to be paying attention to them. So I am really glad to see advocacy movements like this one, just to make sure that the people who are making the rules or might be making the rules in the future are thinking about the trade-offs in the first place. Exactly. And moving on to our fun and neat stories that are not quite so serious. First up, we have this AI clone of Reddit's Am I the Asshole forum will give you the best bad advice. Apologies for the profanity. This is the title of the article, and this is from The Verge. So... There is this uh, Reddit or subreddit called Am, Am I the Asshole, where uh, basically people can uh, post things and tell stories and ask whether they are, you know, what the word I used before. I don't want to <laughs> repeat it too often, but uh, yes. And now there's an AI version where you can post the story and, you know, AI will generate responses. This was created by internet artists Morris Coleman and Alex Petros with actual funding from Digital Void and is, is a website. So you can imagine you can input something, uh, a whole little story of, uh, they have examples in the article that are pretty interesting. Yeah, so if you enter really a couple paragraphs, you get these responses from a bot saying, NTA, you're not the thing, uh, and uh, others will chime in and say that you are bad, right? And they respond pretty clearly to what you have in the story. So really, really quite fun to see this and, and a fun thing to play around with. I'm always a fan of bad advice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, the article has some pretty good uh, details as well. Like this is uh, actually pretty not trivial. They scraped the subreddit and they trained multiple models of that. Uh, for instance, one of them was trained to be supportive, say that you aren't bad. Uh, one was trained to say that you are bad. And another one did both. And uh, also things that, you know, no one is bad. So, um, yeah, I think it's a fun project and you can, I guess, Google it. Um, it's over at 
well, audiovasshole.com. So if you feel like that's amusing or if you want to settle a dispute, go ask this AI what it thinks. Definitely. If you look at the examples that are posted in the article, I won't read them totally out loud just because they're a little bit long. But when you look at the bot's responses, it is pretty impressive to see how they formulate their responses and actually, even if there isn't a ton of detail there, draw on things in the story. So I would love to see more fun projects like this in the future. Our final story today is another unfortunate thing happening with our favorite almost self-driving vehicles, apparently. So a Tesla vehicle using something called Smart Summon apparently crashed into a $3.5 million private jet. And according to The Verge, this was discovered when a video was posted on Reddit last Thursday. This summoning functionality that Tesla offers basically allows a user to summon a Tesla to them, as you can imagine. So Tesla's cars do have this automatic parking feature and the smart summon technology uses essentially the same thing. This incident occurred at an event sponsored by an aircraft manufacturer, Cirrus at Feltz Field in Spokane, Washington. And the video basically shows the Tesla slowly crashing into and then actually pushing the Cirrus Vision Jet across the tarmac. Now, you can use uh, this smart summon feature using the Tesla app on your smartphone and summon your car to you from a maximum distance of 200 feet as long as a car is within your line of sight. Although apparently there's a newer version of the feature that lets owners summon the Tesla vehicles from a bit further away. There are a couple of more details here on what happened. The Reddit user said that this person also owns a Tesla Model Y. Um, this would be the Reddit user, but was not the poor soul who summoned the Tesla around several expensive aircraft and crashed it into the most expensive one. This is just kind of another example of how a lot of these nice technologies are being introduced. A lot of them are quite convenient. Smart Summon, I think, is a really good idea. And Musk has described it as the company's most viral feature ever. But it's pretty clear that there's not a good sense of, A, does it work perfectly? And B, however well it works, how do you use it in ways and in situations so that it doesn't cause other kinds of damage? Yeah, this is uh, pretty funny. You know, <laughs> uh, Tesla often touts how advanced their self-driving tech is, and this is clearly a pretty silly mistake. And in fact, probably points to their approach of camera only, uh, you know, uh, driving and mostly AI driven driving having this flaw. You know, the smart summon feature is meant mostly for parking lots. And here they're trying to use it at this uh, weird, you know, airport type thing outside. Uh, and I can't imagine they're training that it has many planes uh, around. It's kind of surprising that it didn't just uh, avoid hitting something that was in front of it in the first place. Uh, so a lot of strange details in the story. But um, yeah, kind of weird and amusing. And hopefully whoever had this crash happen can either pay for the damages or otherwise uh, make up for it because that is certainly gonna cost some money. I do hope they have a spare three or $4 million lying around that they can pay damages with. It's also worth noting that of course, this isn't the only incident where Smart Summon seems to have failed. So as we said, it was first rolled out in 2019. And pretty soon after that, Tesla owners began posting videos of near crashes or other things going on. Um, one mentioned front bumper damage, and then another talked about how their Model 3 ran into the side of a garage. So if you look at those instances, maybe Smart Summon has improved since then. But it does seem like 
it has failure modes at occurring instances where I'd absolutely expect it to do the right thing. So I'm curious about the data on whether those more obvious issues have actually disappeared at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a while since we've seen something this funny. Although last week we did talk about this uh, cruise, uh, you know, police pullover thing with another autonomous car. So I guess as uh, as we get more autonomous cars out into the roads, we're sure to see more of these sort of shenanigans going on, and it'll be uh, certainly interesting to see what happens. Can't wait. And with that, we're going to go ahead and finish up. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Skynet Today's Last Week in AI podcast. You can find the articles we discussed here today and subscribe to our weekly newsletter with many other articles at lastweekin.ai. And uh, as we always say, we do appreciate your reviews and we do enjoy reading them up front if nothing else new listeners can hear recommendation and stick around to actually see if they like it so please do post uh, reviews even if they're not as positive as the one we read and if you don't do that feel free to just recommend this podcast to your friends or you know um, however else you want to support us we'd appreciate it And be sure to keep tuning in to our future episodes. Thank you all for listening.